chair for today's uh, professor, uh, professorial uh, chairholder presentation. So our speaker is the founder and president of Asher Technologies Incorporated. He is also the dean of the School of Civil, Environmental, and Geological Engineering of Mapua University, Philippines. Dr. Francis Aldrin Uy is the founder and president of Asher Technologies, the first Mapua spin-off company derived from the Universal Structural Health Evaluation and Recording System, or Asher, a project of the DOST Pichard and Mapua University. The Asher system is a 24-7 structural health monitoring online platform for in infrastructures that greatly improves our preparation and response to strong earthquakes and typhoons. Dr. Uy is the DOST Pichard 2018 Outstanding R&D Awardee on Special Concerns and 2018 World Summit Awards, uh, winner of for Smart Settlements and Urbanization cate uh, category. Since the year 2008, he is the Dean of the School of Civil, Environmental, and Geological Engineering at Mapua University. He took his uh, doctor in philosophy in civil engineering at the University of the Philippines. Uh, Diliman, Master of Science in Civil Engineering at the Technological University of the Philippines and Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering at the Mapua Institute of Technology. He is an LIF4 Fellow and a graduate of Leadership in Innovation Fellowship at the Asian Institute of Management under the School of Executive Education. LIF is a part of the Newton Agham program, a collaboration between the UK and the Philippine government. The UK Royal Academy of Engineering, DOST and AIM. He is one of the outstanding Mapuans in 2015. Uh, he is an awardee in the field of academe given by the National Association of Mapua Alumni. He is also a recipient of the 2019 Outstanding ASEAN Science Diplomat Award. Dr. Uy and the Usher System was also internationally recognized in 2019 with the Outstanding Engineering Achievement Award given by the ASEAN Federation of Engineering Organizations or APEO. He is one of the 2019 Manila Water Foundation Engineering Excellence Prize Awardee. He was awarded with the David M. Konsundi Award for Engineering Research in 2020, given by the Philippine Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology or PhilAS. Just recently, he was also awarded the Kapbalikat Researcher Award in line with the DOST Pichard's 10th anniversary this 2020. So ladies and gentlemen, the man of innovation, may I present Dr. Francis Aldin Abalos Uy. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the management of the administration, management of uh, PUP for giving me this opportunity to share with you today what I call an enlightening journey in ushering a safer and more resilient Philippines. Again, I'm Dr. Francis Adrin Uy, and I'm the founder and CEO of Usher Technologies. And I am also the Dean of the School of Civil, Environmental, and Geological Engineering at Mapua University. 
Now, since this is a journey, I can say that my journey started when I realized and accepted what you call leadership and innovation. Two important words, leadership and innovation. Let me start by talking about leadership or leaders. Who are leaders? Leaders, we say, they inspire people. They, they, they are catalysts of change. They are visionaries. They are successful people, trusted people. Okay. And leaders, we say there's legacy. So who are they? Well, each one of us may have our standards when it comes to who are leaders. Now, some may say Bill Gates, especially people in technology like myself, Steve Jobs, and maybe for those in the pol in politics may consider Abraham Lincoln, okay, Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. So maybe those who like showbiz would consider Oprah to be their leader. And there are a lot of people in present and in the past, which each one of us may consider to be a leader. So again, leadership is all about commitment, about responsibility, about passion, about principles, determination, about your purpose, about values. These are a lot of big words about leadership, but it's important for us. It's important for us to understand the meaning of leadership talk about innovation. Now this is a, a table of the most innovative countries way back in uh, 2018. As you can see you have South Korea, you have Sweden, the second, Singapore, you have Germany, you have Switzerland, you have Japan. This year, 2020, is a very good year for the Philippines, for our country, because from 100 in 2014, in the 73rd place in, in 2017, to the, to the 50s, number 50 spot in 2020. So, this would mean that innovation is very much alive in the Philippines. And if you look at also the, the other rankings, then you will see that there are a lot of countries in the Southeast Asia that are really, that are really moving up this, uh, the rank of, uh, in global innovation. So again, currently, or this year, Philippines is at the 50th rank. But of course, you have other countries in Southeast Asia like Vietnam, who is in the 42nd or 42, and uh, rank 42. And you have Singapore, which is rank 8. Okay, Brunei is number 71. Thailand, 44. Malaysia, 33. Uh, Indonesia 85. So uh, we've, I think the government and also of course the private sector have been doing a lot for us to really move uh, up this ranking. And this uh, is very important for us. Now, if you look at the, the, the startup landscape in the country, so you will see uh, startup companies in the area of ride share and delivery, 
in digital transformation, in e-commerce, and of course education, uh, finance, services, in tourism, marketing, communications, healthcare. And I was actually surprised to see Asher under the healthcare sector. I think maybe for the reason that we have been engaged in a number of fight COVID-19 initiatives uh, this year, early this year. So anyway, this is the, the startup landscape in the country. Now we I talk about leadership, then I talk about innovation. But if you look at all the startup companies, all these successful companies, like Facebook, Apple, mm, SpaceX, okay, um, Amazon, behind, behind, or actually not behind, but, it, but the ones leading these companies are great, innovative leaders. So we have a lot of top leaders in, in innovation. So this is the summary for the for this part, first part. Innovation is just a code word for leadership. So when you say you want to be an innovator or you want to go into innovation, you're actually saying you want to be a leader. So these are two words that you cannot separate. If you want to be a leader, you need to be innovative, especially in our era or in or nowadays. It's important to be innovative. There are a lot of technologies around that can make or break an initiative or a company. Now, when you say you want innovation, then you will have to lead. You will have to take charge. Okay, You will have to be in the forefront. If you want to be innovative, you need to be a leader. Now, innovation is the process of translating an idea or an invention into a good or service that creates value or for which customer will create value. So innovation, it is a process okay, from an idea or invention from your lab or from your paper, your idea and your paper, your research paper. It is a process of translating it into a good or a service that will create value okay that will create value for people for your customer or for them to provide value for your customer so that is innovation and this is the reason why our our government specifically the department of science and technology have been doing a lot of initiative or working on a lot of initiative, trying to encourage, to promote to the academe innovation, that for us to move our, our results, our products forward, it should not end in your paper. It should not end in your lab. You should be able to bring this forward, bring this forward, the market to more people for them to avail for them to be able to create value so that is now the trust of government and a lot of uh, uh, private organizations and i myself have, have been uh, is one and my team has, is one of those beneficiaries of these very good initiatives. Now, other things that I realized is that 
But when we do research work, we always we think of we should think of who will be the beneficiary. Uh, is it just something for people to, to read, or is it something for some people or a specific group of people to to take and move and move it forward? So there are different kinds of end user or customer. Uh, if you are doing a research project, you may consider there are different kinds of end users or beneficiaries, let me say beneficiaries for your research work. Now there are, of course, the literal end users, the one who will make use of your, of your invention, of your, of your idea, will make use of your idea directly. And there are also what you call influencers, that with your idea or your invention, they may influence people because they have good networks. They may influence people to, to, to avail, okay? Or to make use or consider or try the, the idea that you present in your paper or the invention that you have come up with. And of course, there are recommenders. Of course, usually these are partners, uh, col uh, collaborators in various organizations. And there you go, you have what you call the economic buyer. Economic buyer, of course, in charge of the purchase. And to finally decide which to avail or if they will avail of your idea of your of your product and of course they have different mindsets these end users have or stakeholders have different mindset that we need to of course be aware of now let's talk about me what i realized is that in our journey there is or there are a lot of needs in the world, in different areas, in the environment, in, in, in society, in engineering, in education, there are a lot every day. There are a lot and it, this continues to grow and somehow it becomes complex. But the point that I would like to present is that we should be able to understand the most important need. Maybe in the subject matter that you are working on or the subject matter that you are trying to study, there could be a number of, shall we say, needs or problems or what we call pains, concerns. Now, it is important that to ask, what is the most important user or market need? So and I'm talking about in the area of commercialization. So what is, Im what is important for the market, okay, for the end user? Okay. And uh, when you, you are able, when you are able to identify the most important need. The next thing to answer is, what is the unique approach? Because maybe that need is already being addressed by, let's say, uh, a technology or uh, a method or process. But still, there could be um, still a problem or in adequacy, or shall we say rooms for improvement. So with you being an innovator, what is the unique approach? And maybe this is what, you know, or a, this will be what you would like to test in a research study or what you would like to evaluate and will be the result of, of your, your study. So what is your unique approach? Then with this unique approach, you ask, 
what are the specific user advantage? What is the advantage of using your approach or the approach that, that you propose with what is already being what are already being used or com or considered what is the specific advantage it's important there should be an advantage you have a unique approach then there should be a unique advantage and of course the last question will be how does this advantage differ from the competition how does it differ from your competitor how does it differentiate you or your product with the other product? What is the differentiating uh, factor? Okay, so when you present an idea, this is a very useful framework. They call the NABC. So first, you can say, what is the need? You state what is the need. Then after that, you say, or you say, what is the approach what is your approach and then be next one is with that approach what's the advantage of using your approach would you be able to uh, save materials will you able to save resources time you, you can do it faster um, or you can do it better you have better products uh, result and of course your your competitive advantage so uh, this can be used actually in, in any in any other um, presentations wherein of course it's important for you to have a framework so that when you present it you're, you follow this framework and it will be much clearer for your audience so NABC another thing that is important us to understand when we are working on an innovation or in the area of innovation or commercialization for our for our research product it's what you call the Maslow's hierarchy of needs so I, I, we, I asked a while ago what is the most important need now another thing to understand is that people or end users may have there are different or vary their needs could vary okay it could be different from one person to the other okay? so maslow says that of course the bottom is your physiological needs and this has something to do with food the basic things in life that we need clothing shelter okay air water then of course the next one will be about security or safety personal security usually employment resources that are available for you uh, of course safety that includes health and of course your property then we go up and it's about love and belonging okay that means your need is about friendship intimacy having a family sense of connection then moving up self-esteem respect about your status in society about being recognized in, in your community about strength and freedom and of course on the top will be self-actualization your desire to become the most that you can be so you or people around you may have their specific needs or different needs so it's important for you again as i mentioned to determine what is the most important need and that's where you drive that's where you drive your innovation Okay, because it's important that you are able to target that because if you really want that you will have a result in your innovation um, 
uh, um, innovation activity and they work then it's important for you to understand when you talk to someone you may need to have a different approach a, a, a different strategy because some people may not really need um, physiological the physiological aspect maybe they want something about being recognized as in society then that's that's where you you develop your approach okay so it's important for us to understand there are different kinds of needs there's an, a hierarchy of of needs now another thing in the journey that i realized is that people avail of things because of two things Yes, it's there. Hope and fear. Okay. So you avail of, say, a new cell phone because you hope that with that cell phone, you are able to do a lot of more uh, or more things when it comes to, I mean, social media, okay, like Facebook or Twitter. Maybe it improves your 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 activity. Um, you buy a shoe, you purchase a shoe because hopefully that will help you perform better um, in the in the court, say basketball. That's why people buy a lot of or purchase uh, Air Jordan, even if Jordan is no longer playing. But uh, people think and hope that when they wear that shoe, that brand of shoe, then it will somehow help them improve their game. A lot, uh, in many aspects, there's this always hope. When you buy something, you hope for something. You hope it will make your life better. You hope it will improve your performance. You, help, you hope that uh, you do your job better. Okay. Hope. On the other hand, it could be also because of fear. Like now, people would like to avail of, a lot of people would like to avail of a vaccine because of our fear with the COVID-19. Okay. And maybe um, people would course um especially in health um you take certain vitamin okay because you fear that of course you you don't your health okay will deteriorate so you need something to 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 improve okay uh, your condition of your body okay um well, especially for, of course, it's about security, about safety and security products. Mostly the, the reason why you, we avail of those security and safety products is our fear. Our, our fear that maybe some a bulb, uh, uh, someone will get into your house. So you avail of a security system. So hope and fear. And actually, this is being used by by a lot of uh, people in the advert in ad advertising, and they would choose any of the two or both in coming up with the commercial advertisements, and really trying to to remind people and to make people realize uh, that if they avail of those products of those uh, of that uh, yeah, product then it will serve their hope or their fear
Okay. Next is what you call a customer journey map. So there's such a thing as a customer journey map. Now basically, uh, what you're trying to do is, and, and this is very important, especially those who would really do, would like to, to work on research projects wherein you, you expect to have something to commercialize at the end. So it's important for you to understand what you call a customer journey map. And actually this, this would require maybe a week class to really understand this. But in summary, basically what you're trying to do is to try to look into in a process. Let's say, um, let's say how uh, people, for example, uh, in our case now, how people avail of, let's say, their grocery, okay? How they avail of those, of their grocery. So if you look at the problem now, and really, you can really look at a number of, of points wherein maybe innovation would really come out or will be identified or would result. So if you look at, the process from the need generation, yes, we need to buy our grocery maybe every week. But the problem now is that we have this pandemic, so it's different. It's not like before that you can just, just go out anytime you want. So the need generation is there. You need to buy a product, products, your grocery. Then the initial consideration is, okay, maybe through social media, you, you post ads, okay, you post ads and for them to, to check out your online shop or online grocery store, okay? Then that's the initial consideration. They, they saw, someone will, will see that ads or will of course be engaged with that ads. So that's the next part, the engagement, the first interruption, okay? Then of course, when they engage in that, then they evaluate. They see if they have those products there, their grocery, the list that they are interested to buy or they need in their, in their homes, okay? And that's where innovation would come in because maybe a certain area would require a different mix of products. Say for, an, let's say in different, it will be different from another area. Or maybe you would like to focus on um, a specific line of products. So there you, you have to understand uh the need let's say based on location or maybe in the in their practice or i mean the uh the how how people say uh purchase groceries in a certain area or or it could be a different uh process or segment market segment and of course if they like the product they like your 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 uh, product list and maybe they purchase and you deliver okay how long do you do how how much time do they need to wait will they wait for a week or uh, maybe for a day or same day delivery so that's also something that you could look into of course they use your product and hopefully they get um, authentic products okay and they will be happy, happy with the, uh, uh, with the transaction that they had with you. Now, it, at first, it may look like the process might look like simple, but if you look into the detail step by step, then you may be able to think of something that could be different or some new, something new that you would like of course, to 
to try and uh, see if that will be interesting to your customers. So the customer journey journey map is basically for us being mindful of the process a customer okay undergo okay in their engagement with with you or the product that you 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 provide. So it's important for you to understand this as early as the research work so that when you this or the some points important points will already be taken care of as early as the research uh, stage the customer journey map okay next is what we call a value proposition value proposition it's, a, it's part of the definition on innovation that was presented a while ago. Create value. You have to create value. Okay. Now, value comes when you understand what we call a, a value proposition canvas. Okay. On the right, you have the jobs to be done. Then you have the pains from by doing those job what are the pains then what are the gains what would make your customer happy what would make their life and job done easier okay and of course as mentioned the pains are the troubles your customer or the end user um, experience and with that you will have to to identify or determine what pain relievers can you provide pain relievers how can you help the customer uh, how to relieve the pain what problems can be eradicated and on top with those gains of course you need gain creators what can you offer your customer to help them achieve their gains okay now at the end once you answer all of these things or identified all of these things, then you will have the product or the service. What are the products and service you can offer your customer and you will be able to identify the value proposition, your value proposition. Now in, again, value proposition is all about what jobs to do so if you are working on a research project a research project you try to ask yourself again why am i doing this project what is it for will it help someone to do his job better and what is the job how does it do they do it conventionally or currently how they do, how do they do it so that's the job to be done then of course looking at the, the the current technology the current state method or process that is being um, used then you will identify the pain points okay, you will identify the pain points or the needs and there will be a number of needs okay there will be a number of needs and of course again going back there are hierarchy of needs again there are different means for different uh, stakeholders or end users that you consider then of course when you say need pains yes those are needs so on top you say gains basically these are wants okay so it would be good if you will be able to address the pains and also you are able to provide the ones, okay, the ones. Of course, everyone knows at this point, what do you mean by a need and a want? Uh, a want or wants versus needs, okay? Now, with those pains or needs, you provide the pain reliever. How can you solve those problems? 
how will you address their needs? And of course, with those ones, of course, you need to uh, have game creators to further address those ones. Because if you are able to provide both for the needs and the ones, then you will have a very good uh, value proposition. Now, let's take the example of a small local shop. Okay, a small local shop, they sell goods, they identify customer needs, order goods, they do marketing, provide discount. That's the job to do or jobs that they need to do. And it might it could be that different people will have to do each or maybe one will have to do a number of those things. Now, with the pains, so what are the pains that they experience now? They have a known sales track, unknown customer preference. They don't know really the characteristic of their or, uh, attributes of their customers. Unknown lifetime value of customers. Um, really know if there, if there are what we call repeat orders or if their customers comes back. Two wide offerings, high cost. They have products, but there's no deep or strategy or deep understanding on why they're selling those products and losses due to undisposed items. So that's the that's the result um, of that. So the pain reliever will be, of course, uh, information about the customer. You want information about the customer, customer overview. So you would better understand your customer the customer shopping history okay what do they buy okay is it did they buy it weekly monthly uh um sell now okay uh low sales goods okay um now on the other hand the the ones hmm, surprise customer okay sorry Added things. You want a better relationship with your customer. Oh, personalized discounts. Okay. Now the gains. Okay, the gain creators. If you want to provide all those things, personal discounts, better, better relationship, then you will have to give discounts. Okay. And customer preferences, and maybe some some gifts. Okay, raffle. Uh, maybe a raffle will do, okay? And for you to provide this, to have an information system and uh, provide all those discount uh, and free gifts or freebies, okay? To your customer to, to somehow make the transactions better, then you end up with a product and a service, a customer relation module or management system, okay? And that will take care of all the needed information that, from, that you need from your customers and for you to be able to provide uh, recognition or, or, or rewards, okay? Now, another example, maybe this will be much easier to understand, okay? Let's talk about Grab or Uber. Okay, uh, the, the end user or people who commutes or people who needs to go to places every day, maybe for job or, or recreation or other reasons. And uh, of course, before you have to call a taxi, you may, maybe there's a, a phone number or you may might need to find a taxi, that means before you, you have to go out of your village or your subdivision at the gate and maybe there you wait uh, for a taxi to pass by. Um, then, of course, once you ride the taxi, then before you will really have to give the directions, especially if they are not familiar with the place. So you will have to say, uh, go straight, go to left, go or right okay you have to give the directions and of course you have to pay in cash okay so the pains with all these things is that the mentioned are 
course, you will have to wait a long time. You will have, you don't know when taxi will pass by. Um, we'll, you might be overcharged by the taxi. It's possible because uh, maybe they may even ask for a tip. Uh, compete with other customers. Okay, you went out of your village just to wait, and of course, by the time you you arrive at the at the waiting chat, uh, then you find ten more people waiting for for a taxi. So you have to compete, and of course, uh, I'm safe. Uh, driver because uh, uh, of course you you don't know who or initial information about the driver um, but before you ride so. so what happened is that with grab or uber they have given what instant booking okay so you have now instant booking um, we're in of course with by using a a mobile phone you are able to to book for your taxi and of course the system will assign a driver and initial information of the driver is provided and of course they have also uh, assessed the, the driver because there's a application process for them then you have the cost system okay and uh, because there's already a computation in the app, then no need for cash, cashless. Okay, you can pay using your credit card or maybe other means like Grab Pay, GCash, PayMaya. All right, now the ones is uh, aside from, of course, finding or calling a taxi, hopefully you will able to arrive on time. And yes, because uh, with the mapping technology that we have now, then you would really save time uh, because even directions are given uh, to, of course, for you to, to hmm, get away from traffic. Uh, fair price, uh, professional drivers, yes. Easy payment, yes. Okay, there's a rating system even for, for drivers. And of course, well, the product that you have is a taxi smartphone app, okay? Taxi smartphone app, okay? So that's for the taxi smartphone application. Now let me explain value proposition to you um, with the uh, projects that I am involved with. The first project is ARMS. ARMS is an advanced new real-time weather data monitoring system for the cost-effective management of water resources. So our stakeholder or the end user here is the National Water Research Board or NWRB. And the job to be done or the job is to monitor weather data. Now their current problem now or the pains are the following they have very limited data and they depend on other organizations for data and when they do they do it manually so our pain reliever is a low-cost equipment or the development of low-cost equipment with a 24 7 monitoring uh, system that of course will uh, result to uh, paperless uh, um, reporting. And uh, of course the gains is, are the following. Uh, they also want to be, to be or the NWRB to have an innovative image. And of course they're interested water with watershed models and of course the training of their personnel. So we produce gain creators and that is of course the partnership with the Department of Science and Technology and of course Mapua University. And uh, we have uh, computer models and technology transfer as part of the project. So at the end, we now provide 
value to NWRB, and that is a low-cost monitoring system that allows remote monitoring of weather data. So that is ARMS. Now another project is UPARTS. UPARTS is an easy-to-use mobile and web-based application that facilitates a more reliable, comprehensive, and faster road accident reporting. Now the, the stakeholder here is the, Philipp the Philippine National Police or PNP. And the job to be done is to investigate and analyze reporting of road accident. And as we know, the pains that they have now is that they do paper-based uh, um, investigation or paper and pen. And after investigation, they report back to their office and do manual encoding. And they are also having problem now with the storage of these uh, files, of the files that are accumulated through the years. And of course, creation of report is uh, a big challenge to them. And our pain reliever now is that we develop a mobile and web-based web application that will facilitate the investigation. And they will also benefit from the uh, various mobile technology like location intelligence to enhance their uh, investigation and reporting. And of course, data analytics and, and generation of, of, of insights will now be a product of this uh, system. Now the gains, uh, what they want is, of course, to make it things more automated. And uh, the, a system that will enable them to collaborate with other agencies. And the mobile application, the web-based application, are and the features are designed to be collaborative so in the end the value that we offer or that uh, pnp can uh, uh, can uh, get from this undertaking is a fast easy and reliable road accident investigation and reporting system that is you parts now there's another project i call it we call it crowdpoint um, CrowdPoint um, is a citizen engagement and good governance platform for everyone, okay, for everyone, actually for, for uh, every citizen. So the, every citizen or citizens have concerns, have issues, daily issues or concerns as small as garbage collection or maybe an open manhole or, um, or maybe um, there's an illegal parking somewhere. So the pains now is that there is no direct communication. They, we don't know really whom to report to, who can really address our concern. You just put it in uh, or post it on Facebook and hopefully someone will notice it and or maybe uh, um, a lot of people will uh, look into it and hopefully it will reach the right person uh of course but that would uh, uh not be um and there will be no assurance for for every report and uh of course concerns will remain to be unresolved and the pain reliever now is of course um a mobile application uh, mobile and web-based application that will facilitate easy reporting and it could provide validation and ticketing uh, system for the for the government uh, and ca case updates and notifications so that uh, the reporter the citizen will be able to know um, the update on the report that they have submitted now of course uh, gains once uh, maybe or is there a way that you will be recognized yes through what you call rewards or points uh, through a point system and uh, the reward points can be converted into let's say a free ticket to ride the bus or the MRT um, or maybe a ticket for the cinema 
Um, and at the end, you have now an easy reporting platform for everyone. An easy reporting platform for everyone. Okay, that has something to do with citizen engagement and good governance. So that is the value proposition and the value proposition is very important because the value proposition that you will develop becomes the heart it becomes the heart of your business model okay the business model so it's important that uh, you develop this uh, value proposition it should be clear okay it should be clear because it will be the heart it will be the heart of everything that you do the how you model the the, the business um it everything will 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 be or this will be the center of uh ev or of your engagement with your customers with the end user and of course on what you do uh, on your part so if you have seen a business model canvas so this is a very simple illustration of what uh business model canvas as you can see you have the value proposition the center uh, on the right side of the screen you have the the things about customer relations about the customer who is your customer uh, what segment of the market really is your customer how do you develop relationship how do you connect with your customer how do you deliver uh, the product or the service to your customer and on the left side is more of your uh what are your key activities uh what are your key resources what are your, who are your key partners for you to be able to to develop and of course uh, deliver your your product or your service and at the bottom and the left you have of course the cost of your activities and on the right bottom that is the uh about uh this is about uh, revenue generation uh, okay so this is a very simple uh illustration of a, a business model but uh will not discuss a lot about business model today um but anyway here's uh just for you to have uh more idea about a business model so as you can see you have your say the google business model so actually they have a lot of things here uh, in, the, in their business model. But again, what is important is uh, the center of it, again, is what you call the value proposition. Okay, so their value proposition, you have the web search, uh, Gmail, Google, targeted ads using AdWords, uh, extend ad campaigns using AdSense, display advertising management uh, services, their OS and platform Android, okay, uh, hosted web-based Google apps. So that's uh, where the center of uh, what the business uh, is all about, the Google business is all about. And again, on the right, I mentioned about customer relationship, okay, and the, the customer segment and the channels. Okay, the channels has something to do on, on how you are able to, to reach your customers. Or the end users uh, and then on the left side of course your key activities the key resources so you can see data center is a key resource for uh, Google business and of course the IPs uh, are very important to them and the brand okay you have the key partners there distribution partners um, of course the cost structure at the bottom on, on left and the, on the right the revenue stream so uh, this is uh, a very important uh, 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 model uh, that um, where you would really need to start if you if you really want to go into uh, commercialization. Uh, it's important that the value proposition is very clear, and from there you try to think about how you relate with your customer and. On the on the other side, how you are able to to um, develop to maintain sustain your product or your service, okay? And of course, you have to think about the cost structure and the revenue structure. Now, 
um, I'll end this thing about leadership and innovation with a video. Um, it, this is in, in TED Talk, uh, Derek Sievers' uh, TED Talk. Is it about? Is it? It is about how do leaders start a movement? Okay, how do leaders start a movement? Because in my experience, really, like um, Asher, when we started, it's like no one really thought that Asher would really think that Asher will achieve what we it has achieved until today. It's just a small research project. We have bigger research project than than the Smart Bridge where Asher came uh, was uh, was derived. So um, this is a very important uh, and, um, process of enlightenment, uh, which I hope you would uh, really benefit uh, today. So uh, let's watch the watch, let's watch the the video. So ladies and gentlemen, at TED, we talk a lot about leadership and how to make a movement. So let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons from it. First, of course, you know, a leader needs the guts to stand out and be ridiculed. <laughs> but what he's doing is so easy to follow. So here's his first follower with a crucial role. He's going to show everyone else how to follow. Now notice that the leader embraces him as an equal. So now it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Now there he is calling to his friends. Now if you notice that the first follower is actually an underestimated form of leadership in itself. It takes guts to stand out like that. The first follower is what transforms a lone nut into a leader. <laughs> and here comes a second follower. Now it's not a lone nut, it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. So a movement must be public. It's important to show not just the leader, but the followers, because you find that new followers emulate the followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, and immediately after, three more people. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point. Now we've got a movement. <laughs> so notice that as more people join in, it's less risky. So those that were sitting on the fence before now have no reason not to. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed but they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. So <laughs> over the next minute, you'll see all of the, uh, those that prefer to stick with the crowd because eventually they would be ridiculed for not joining in. And that's how you make a movement. But let's recap some lessons from this. So first, if you are the type like the shirtless dancing guy that is standing alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals. So it's clearly about the movement, not you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we might have missed the real lesson here. The biggest lesson, if you noticed, did you catch it? Is that leadership is over-glorified. That yes, it was the shirtless guy was first, and he'll get all the credit, but it was really the first follower that transformed the lone nut into a leader. So as we're told that we should all be leaders, that would be really ineffective. If you really care about starting a movement, have the courage to follow and show others how to follow. And when you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first one to stand up and join in. And what a perfect place to do that, Ted. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so hmm. um, let, that, that's I think the, one of the shortest presentation that I've, uh, I've seen. And, but shortest, but very powerful. I, I believe in, in, in my case, that really this, is a, this has affected uh, how I, uh, of course, uh, think about leadership and just to recap so yes it's true leaders are usually over glorified and 
if you are a leader, you have to nurture your followers, your, especially your first followers. They're the ones who, who believe in you. Um, um, uh, really, at first, uh, there will be not so many people that will understand what you're, you're doing, that will be interested in what you're doing. Uh, until, of course, you already have followers, you have uh, people are really already talking about what you're doing, uh, about your initiative. And it is, it is important to understand that becoming the first follower is also a form of leadership. Okay. Actually, it's, um, it's also a great challenge to really follow someone, especially when it's like only few or only you, uh, could understand or at that mo at that point believes in, in in what someone is trying to do so it takes a lot of of courage it will take a lot of courage to become a follower um, especially when you hear people talking about that uh, a person um, uh, on the negative um, commenting about uh, a person in a negative way so it will really take a lot of guts to really follow someone um, so have the courage to follow when you see someone who is trying to do something great now this is something that of course um, we need to learn along the way um, we should have an eye on what could or something that could be great and of course it will it will depend on on what you believe is your purpose and on, on what you think you can you can offer you can contribute uh, your strengths of course so um, it's important that uh, that uh, of course we we need to to respect other people's uh, uh, opinion or their idea or or their initiative in this case um because at first maybe we cannot uh, later on maybe uh, they're really coming up with something that is important for the world and of course look for that loan up for when you decide to follow you have decided to become a leader. So again, uh, leadership is not always being in front. It's not about being always the, the, the face of, of something, but as a follower, as a follower, you are also a leader, okay? We are actually all leaders in our own, our own, own ways. So uh, it's important to, to understand this when we talk about uh, leadership. All right. So, uh, um, again, going back. So the, I've been talking about the most important need. Yes, because it's important for us to understand the most important need, even when we are doing research. There are a lot of things that could come around and would be very interesting, very interesting to 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 address. Um, and but you have to understand that a research project has its beginning and its end, and you would really would like to pursue and continue doing your research, right? So what I'm just trying to say is that I hope you can identify that most important need because when you identify that most important need there will be someone to champion it self-actualization there will be someone to report to support it self-esteem there will be someone who will fight for it love and belong there will be someone who will avail for it Okay, there's their need, their safety need. Okay, and someone 
will pay for the bills. That is very important. At the end of the day, someone will have to pay for the bill. Or you should be able to generate revenue to support your initiative. So commercialization is not really something bad. As an academician, I can say that it's really about sustainability, about uh, for about uh, an initiative that can be moved forward, that can be sustained forward. And it's very important to understand that. What else? The composition of your team is important. Um, Asher, the board of directors of Asher are not all engineers. Of course, I have. I am part of the board. I have uh, engineer uh, Fibus Cruz, an electrical electronics engineer, all part of the team. We have uh, engineer Don Santiago, who is a computer engineer. Actually, we are all from graduates of, uh, of the same university. And you have uh, Mr. Claro Sablan, who is a who is a business graduate at De La Salle and AIM. And you have attorney George Habacon, who is a lawyer, graduate of Ateneo. And you have uh, our finance. You have uh, Jolo Martires, who is an accountant, seasoned accountant. Because in reality, in a business, you it's hard it, you cannot be all engineers okay someone will have to take care of the legal aspect of the business someone will have to take care of course the business administration side of the of the of the of the, of the business and of course an accountant okay an accountant so it's important that when you engage in an an innovation uh, project and you would like to move to commercialization, it's important that you have a good mix of people working together for that commercialization project. Now, this is something that uh, I also learned because uh, as an academician, I mean, having a position in a school and being able to write papers, present papers local and abroad, it's like the dream come true, yes. And uh, I never thought that I'll be, of course, leading a commercialization project, which is the first for a university like Mapua since its founding in 1925. But someone told me that if an initiative does not make you feel uneasy, then it is not worth it. Okay. There will be a time in your life wherein it's like everything is all good. Okay, you should worry. You should worry. Because there are still a lot of things that you can do. Okay, so you should not stop. You have to continue to learn, continue to lead. And that is really living. Learning, leading is living. So a commercialization project is really an, an easy. There is a lot of risk. Even now, we're taking a lot of, of risk. But of course, you, you will have to believe in your cause, in your purpose, in your team. You have to believe in your team that you will find success one day. You will find success. Okay. You must strive to become the best. And that is true. The competition is really tough. Okay, like 
uh, in our case, Asher is the only Filipino made technology. The rest are uh, of Japanese origin, uh, American, Australian. You know, these are very well developed countries. They they have all the the credibility and and of course the the resources to really be good to become really good in, into something. And I, we just thank the, the government through the D Department of Science Technology and help us a lot to for us to support us in striving to become uh, the best. And I learned this from no other than <laughs> Mr. Uh, Dr. Dado Banatao, who is a, of course a, a well-known Silicon Valley philanthropist. So he's a, at Mapua, we call him like the technology legend, okay? technology guru. Okay, so uh, it's true. We must really strive to become the best because when you offer something uh, into the market or to people, you would really want the best result okay? and the best feedback from them. Okay, another thing is that know your rights. Know, know your rights. You have the Technology Transfer Act. You have laws and policies. You have the IP policy of your, of your respective uh, universities or organizations. But hope that find hope that everyone, not just you, will act with justice and give what is due to everyone, and observe honesty and good faith. Okay. So negotiations later on, or negotiations are a very sensitive, it's a very sensitive um, activity. And of course, you need to be, be careful as well. And just make sure that you are doing things in good faith. And of course, you also have to guard the process that, of course, making sure that what is due will be given uh, to, to, to all concerned. So um, that's really something that uh, really hard when it comes to, to, to a business. Uh, when there is already, uh, of course, there's already uh, money involved. When there's already, already money involved, it's a different story it becomes a very different story, a very different environment. But as a leader, you will have to find ways for people, okay, and for those whom you transact with to do things in good faith, observe honesty, and of course, justice. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about leadership innovation. Now let me um, uh, present to you uh, what Azure technology or what is Azure um, all about. What you call the big one is imminent. It's not a matter of if, it's, it is just a matter of when. 
um, authorities, scientists have been reminding us, they've been reminding us that the next big quake may happen within our lifetime, especially here in Metro Manila. This is why we came up with Usher. It's all about saving lives. In 2015, the Department of Public Works and Highways came out with the, the, with the circular about guidelines or about a guideline and implementing rules on earthquake recording instrumentation for buildings. And of course, we know that this is in accordance with the National Structural Code of the Philippines. And the National Structural Code okay, is the reference code for the National Building Code. Now, to summarize, the DPWH guidelines requires us of the following. First is the mandatory installation of what you call structural health monitoring system or ERI, earthquake recording instrument. And after that, the constant monitoring of structural integrity, data retrieval interpretation, data storage and archiving. And this requirement is, is not just for government, but also for schools, for hospitals, for commercial buildings like malls, for government, for industrial building, and of course, especially high-rise building, especially our uh, condominium buildings. Now, this requirement is supported by a number of uh, circular, like the DTI, DILG, and DPWH joint memo circular. Uh, in 2019 and also there is an executive number 52 uh, under the office of the president and this create on the creation of a program management office for earthquake resilience of the greater metro manila area there is also of course uh, in and following that executive order you have the DPWH Department Order 75 that is on the creation, of course, of the Program Management Office uh, for Earthquake Resilience. So you have all these policies. You have, you have, there's an urgency for us to, to prepare for the big one. You have uh, the support of, of government, but unfortunately, since 2015 and until now, the compliance rate is estimated at less than 8%. 8%. So how can we say now that we are ready for the big one? Well, building owners at first um, say that the technology is very expensive and that is true because uh, before Asher, all the products out there are foreign made. So we import it from another country and that makes it more expensive. And of course, a lot of building owners do not really understand the use because this is a, a specialized field uh, in structural engineering, which we call structural health monitoring. SHM. S SHM, Structural Health Monitoring, is not really something new in structural engineering in other countries. Now, um, how did we come up with the value proposition for Asher? So, Asher is a cost effective 24 7 structural health monitoring system for buildings and bridges that is economical and hassle-free okay it's economical and hassle-free so if you look if we go back to the value proposition canvas so 
let's say you are a building owner, what do you need to do? Comply with the requirement. Comply with the requirement of the government. Okay? And that is the installation of the earthquake recording instrument. Okay. Now, the pain there or the problem is that, as mentioned, it's expensive. It, it is expensive. All are foreign made. They are highly technical. It's like a box then. What's the use? How are we going to make use of the data? How are we going to make use of the data? We don't do data analytics. We're not a structural engineer. We don't have a structural engineer. So th those uh, comments from the building owners. And of course, incomplete solution. Because if you read the, the requirement of DPWH, it doesn't stop with the installation of the earthquake recording instrument. It requires you to continuously monitor uh, and get, you have to, to retrieve data, okay, analyze the data, interpret the data. Um, the pain reliever that we provided is a low cost equipment. It becomes low cost because of course we design it that way and it is locally made, designed and manufactured. And using internet, the concept internet of things, we are able to marry it with a web portal system. And this is a 24 seven monitoring web portal system. And we develop a number of uh, tools or algorithms that will help analyze data automatically. Okay, it's not just gathering data, but it is continuously interpreting interpreting the data based on structural parameters required by your structural engineer. And of course, we partner with a lot of organizations, not just structural engineering uh, firms. Now there are um, ones that we also that we also identified out of our market validation uh, activities, like would there be insurance, uh, complete compliance service? Can we just talk to you and after that we just receive our certificate? Uh, how about an alert system? How are we going to be able to be informed quickly and uh, easily on what to do? How do we respond, especially after an earthquake? So the game creator there, of course, is that we uh, partnership with organizations and top structural engineering firm. And we designed our system in a way that it has a color coding uh, it has a color alert uh, system, okay, that provides uh, the initial response that is needed, especially after a strong earthquake. So it will make it easier for for people to understand uh, what they need to do. Do, do they need to evacuate the building, or uh, it's safe to stay in the building? or is it dangerous to stay in the building and we need an emergency evacuation. So the end, we develop Azure, an economical and hassle-free compliance solution. Okay, so that's how we develop our uh, value proposition. And this is where our, our business model, uh, cent the center of our, uh, of our uh, business model, um, is this value proposition okay mm. now to to understand uh, how our the technology works we can talk about your heart doctor okay your heart doctor requires you to, uh, to or after getting the result of your ECG or they can also use their stethoscope they, they, they try to hear your heartbeat and they try to analyze your heartbeat pattern, okay? They try to analyze your heart, heartbeat pattern and see if you have uh, indication problem, okay? That, that's how it works. But let us first see this, uh, this video.
unlike your heart doctor, that analyze the heartbeat pattern of the patient to determine the position of heart without the the structure of engineer also do what we call statistical pattern analysis. Okay, or the vibration analytics. For them to relate this uh, analysis with what we call the integrity, uh, structure integrity. Okay, so that's uh, the principle of, of this uh, technology. Now, as mentioned, structural health monitoring is not really new in other countries, but in our country, uh, I can say that uh, uh, I've learned about this way back uh, 2000, I think about year 2000 with, uh, with a group of engineers and they're trying to make use of, of uh, vibration data, acceleration data for the analysis of structures. And since then, 2000, I, of course, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, ver uh, editions or what they call updates on the National Structural Code, uh, but only in uh, uh, 2015 that this was made clear. And that's also when the DPW's guidelines came out, okay? Though actually way back in 2014, we were already looking for someone to fund the project. We tried to, to convince a private uh, uh, structural firm, but unfortunately they did not believe us during that time. And uh, actually when we were really getting traction, uh, they went back to us and, and asked us if partner with us, but unfortunately, uh, it's no longer uh, possible because uh, sometime 2016, we were working on the Smart Beach project. And after that, you have, we have other projects like the, the Phil Sims uh, and the Dames project. The Dames project is a research project with, with PVOX um, and Phil Sims is with DPWH. So, um, Early or late last year, we had the soft launching of Azure Technologies as a, the spin off uh, with the support of the fast track program of the Department of Science and Technology, technology uh, specifically uh, Fisher. Okay, so um, we hope to continue to, to do a lot of work on structural health monitoring. We have been publishing a number of papers about the results of our work and just recently we joined this international organization of structural health monitoring experts so we really hope to to continue uh, learning shm and advancing our technology now the market is huge in structural health monitoring um, about worldwide it could reach about two billion dollars. Um, the market here in the country, if you, based on our uh, estimates, there are about eighty-five thousand buildings covered, or under the requirement for, for ERI, eighty-five thousand. And I, I said a while ago that only eight percent complied. So there's still a lot. Not and it will be a long way. But of course, that's the reason why. We develop our own technology is for us to really be able to possibly accomplish this 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 uh, this task this uh, purpose and of course you have 15 countries along the pacific ring of fire that will be needed in this kind of this kind of technology you have the asean open market and one important thing that we really need to emphasize is that this requires long-term engagement and this is very important that we develop our local technology because a lot of experience uh, or a lot of developers experience this problem wherein of course the after sales or the maintenance of, of this uh, uh, the system or, or device is required uh, long-term okay, engagement. 
because as you know the, the reason why you do structural monitoring is to to be able to do proper maintenance and prolong the the lifespan of your structure the, though by design by design uh it is 50 to as much as 100 years the design the lifespan of a of a, a building or a structure so it requires long-term uh, engagement and this is how we position usher in the market so we put it in a position that of course it is economical and uh, yet economical and it provides additional features that will be very beneficial with uh, with our building uh, um, building owners so aside from the cost the, the 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 unit cost that is much lower than than uh, other eri and the costs here are for for the unit cost and installation um we also provide other features like of course the web portal uh, and one important uh, or differentiating uh, factor for us is that we uh, develop our own uh, structural health monitoring module or reporting module which is very important especially after an, uh, an earthquake because you don't just want to gather or record data you would like to automatically analyze it in relation to to the design or the, the model, the structural integrity of your building. And of course, for people on the go, especially structural engineers trying to, who are in charge of the structures, it's important for them to portably or on the go by just using the mobile application, they will be able to access data. And the, the official pool of a structural engineering firm is very important because they're the ones who, at the end of the day, will have to do to, to, uh, the the work and a decision uh, for structures if they are still safe to be to be used or occupied and of course it's also important that of course we continue uh, research and development and that's a good thing for Asher because we have local R and D and also uh, everything is man or the product is manufactured uh, locally. Um, okay, since we started, actually Asher is very young. We just started uh, full operation in February this year. And unfortunately, of course, we were affected also by the COVID-19. But still, we are happy to note that we already have uh, our uh, servicing. I provided Asher and providing service to uh, nine private buildings. Um, uh, 17 government buildings. Uh, we need to, so I think there are about 20 already. I uh, have at, at least finished 17 um, buildings. And for government bridges, we are already installed uh, the units for six bridges and four more. So, so that's uh, really something important for us to. So that we will be able to to show that we are we are really up to this task of um, providing this uh, system to um, to build for for buildings and other critical structures like like bridges. And a uh, good thing about and this kind of initiative is that, of course, you get to meet a lot of people. Uh, widen your your network and of course uh, um, be able to have the chance to work with great people with with uh, with great leaders and this is something that uh, the the USDP shared uh, has really uh, provided us through the years uh, when we were trying to of course uh, uh, trying to to build or or develop the product and and commercialize and now usher operating as a as a as a company as a spin-off company and uh, we're also proud to to, to to share that 
um, through the years, we have uh, uh, acquired a number of, um, or we're given actually, a number of awards, uh, both local and international. Um, we are very proud of this because um, being the only Filipino made uh, earthquake recording instrument or structural health monitoring system in the world, it makes us proud um, and happy to as a service to the to the country and being part of this uh, initiative of the government of DOST to promote uh, innovation and uh, since we won that award in the USDP shared way back 2018 then we went to Portugal or the World Summit Awards then the Cafeo Award, the Manila Waters, and uh, just recently the David Kunsunji Award for Engineering Research, and of course the Kabalikat Award. Uh, fortunately, it was it was not yet included here, but uh, the thing about this is it's all about um, recognition of the great effort and work that was done not just by myself but also um, by our team at Asher Technologies. And every year, we continue to, <clears throat> to present the advancement in about Asher. And this July, we just started our, um, <clears throat> our annual Asher event every July because it's the disaster resilience uh, month for the country, for the Philippines. So every July we we showcase the advancement that we have made, uh, both for the for the device and the software that that we that we use, and also other products we that we have developed. So next year, in on July next year, we will launch Azure 2.0. So it will be smarter, um, smaller, and more powerful, because uh, we are now work trying to work on new algorithms. Um, and also the use of uh, AI technology in, in our uh, in our system. So hopefully in July, we we will be able to to <clears throat> to launch more products uh, next year. Now let me end this presentation with this reminder for everyone. The threat of a strong earthquake remains, even during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. So let us continue to make our, our buildings safe, our structures safe. Together, let's continue to usher a safer and more resilient Philippines. Good day to all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uy. Um, to borrow the words of also Dr. Dado Banatao, he said, to borrow and replace Dr. Banatao, he said that we Filipinos already know thank hardship. First of all, it is time for us to learn success, and we can learn success through embracing a culture of innovation and also by uh, we can also learn success by asking experts um, in different fields and that is the reason why we are now uh, opening the open forum for everybody all the particip participants to ask questions to dr Uwe, who luckily is with us today okay uh, uh, hi good morning good morning sir um, the first question uh, came from one of our faculty members, Engineer Labardini, and uh, she wants to uh, know how much is the needed capital to start your innovation into business. And there is a follow-up question from the Bicol University, Engineer uh, Carl Peralta, uh, asking if 580,000 pesos is uh, viable enough uh, to start your business. 
Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, with, with regards to how much capital you need, it, it would depend on on the first on the product because uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, if you recall the the business canvas on the left side, uh, you have there the, your key activities, uh, and uh, of course that includes your your key resources. So it, it it would depend on the on the initiative. Like in our case, it is heavy on hardware. Um, that means manufacturing. So it it is very significant on our part because uh, you will it requires you to do manufacturing wow. and not just do manufacturing and not just okay and so, and not just any manufacturing, just any but, manufacturing uh, but you will have to. Will have to um, uh, um, follow uh, international standards, so that makes it even more expensive. You will have to to test your products in uh, international recognized uh, laboratory. Uh, that will add to to the cost. Now, in some cases, if you your technology or your product is heavily software or it's software like uh, the apps that we know now, uh, it, it will be much easier uh, uh, because uh, there will be no need for too much uh, investment on, on, on hardware. Okay, uh, but of course, uh, you still need some in IT infrastructure that would uh, help in the operation of your, of your software, say a mobile application. Uh, or a web-based application, and uh, it it would really vary. It would depend on on the kind of product, and of course also how you would like to go to the market, as they say. Okay, because of course it's up to it. It depends on your appetite. If you just want to take it slowly, and versus you want to really make a an aggressive impact in the in the market. But as a startup, of course. Uh, as we know, uh, startups uh, for startups, they, they would really start uh, 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 with a small uh, initiative, or as, as they say, lean, no? lean startup. They, they term it like that, uh, because of course, uh, being a startup, uh, uh, you don't necessarily have that uh, enough capital, and you will have to to acquire those needed resources along the way. Uh, in relate, let's say. Um, in, in terms of partnership or collaboration uh, with the other organizations. So it will really depend on your initiative. Okay, okay. sir. Another question from our participant, Mr. Melchor Peralta. Is there a possibility to include structural health monitoring to be included in building permit requirements since this is an important equipment monitoring of the safety of the structure? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, actually, there's already um, a guideline, or uh, yes, in the National Structural Code of the Philippines, and also this was followed by the Department of Public Works guidelines on building instrumentation, uh, that the memorandum that was issued by DPWH. So actually, there is already that uh, that requirement uh, be because this has something to do with uh, say, for example, for occupancy permit, if it's a, if a new build, it's a new building. Uh, the concerned unit uh, should, uh, which is of course, if it's a private uh, building and it's the building official, uh, then they will have to look for this uh, uh, um, uh, feature or or device in your in your building, and also for you to. Uh, renew your business permit. Uh, it's also par, par, um, included in the what you call the checklist. So you can consider this like your um, your fire extinguisher. Okay, the fire extinguisher, which is of course a requirement. Okay, uh, and um, they usually check that no, if your the officials will go to your to your place, especially if it's a commercial building. Um, operating and you are ask or renewing your business permit, then it should it should be part of the checklist. 
but as I mentioned in my presentation, since That's 2015, uh, it's still very low. The compliance rate is uh, very low. And uh, I think I mentioned a number of reasons uh, why. But, uh, well, it's really something. It's a challenge. And th I, that is one of the reasons why Asher was uh, supported by, by DOST. Because in, with the idea that hopefully with a locally made uh, uh, technology, uh, this may more or people are concerned will be have the more um, will have the ability to 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 purchase it or to acquire it um, but because it's very important as mentioned it's uh, especially in metro manila and other parts where there are there are active fault lines this is really about structural health monitoring uh, we would really like to monitor the performance of our building and at the end of it is really trying to make sure that uh, people will be safe because in the event of an earthquake our first line of, of defense are the buildings we're into uh, every day we go to work we're inside the building okay we go we go home maybe you're living in a condominium building so it's really important that uh, your safety is uh, being uh, uh, taken care. I mean, uh, is uh, someone is looking out for for your safety, and even after an earthquake, because the next question after an earthquake is is the, after an evacuation is is it safe to go back? And the honest answer to that is that currently what we are doing is just we're doing visual inspection. Okay, we don't really have a good basis whether it's safe to go back, but still we've been taking that risk to go to go back without the uh, very. Uh, um, good uh, analysis or uh, decision, uh, basis for the decision. Thank you, sir. So thank you very much, uh, sir. I hope that uh, your question was answered. Uh, next question from uh, Mr. Uh, Carl Arman Serio Tolosa. Uh, he's asking, how much is the cost of availing the Asher SM, uh, SHM system, and what are the positive impacts of uh, installing uh, that system here in our country? Okay, um, yes, uh, I, there, there's a slide that was presented a while ago, and uh, it's at uh, the, the value that's there is at 580, okay? But uh, of course, it depends, that's the unit, okay? But uh, it will depend on the on the condition of the building because sometimes there are civil works that are needed that is part of the of the of the of making it operational and also other services like sometimes or actually most of the cases we have a lot of buildings without plans okay the, the building plans are actually missing and especially for government buildings and maybe this is also the reason why we should go for other technologies like BIM building information modeling that is being advocated by Dr. De Castro uh, because it's it's really hard because uh, that will require you again to do uh, the the aspilt or or coming up with the with the plan and then also the structural models are, are not there so you will have to uh, do the analysis again from scratch, so this really adds to to this um, uh, to the cost of uh, really putting up a structural health monitoring system, no? an effective structural health monitoring system. By the way, in installation of the device, it, that's not the end of it. Okay, uh, that's the, one of the things that uh, I would like to clarify. That when you install the device, the job is done. No. Installing the device and also uh, have um, the importance of having a structural model uh, with it uh, because uh, that's your yeah, that's your baseline the the, the, the design of the structure uh, presented by your by your model and basically you're comparing the actual readings with the simulations that that is produced using uh, your the, your structural engineering software and in time you'll be able to further understand that okay, because of the uh, data that will be the, that will be generated in, in various uh, various events 
So um, the importance of it is that really structural health monitoring, um, it can help us uh, determine if there would be, uh, there are, one is, of course, uh, the reason why you, you have this structural monitoring is that there are factors that uh, it's hard to really determine and measure from the design to the construction. Okay, that's another reality. Okay, that's a real, especially in, in in the Philippines. The design, yes, it's uh, it's it. Of course, it's based on the, the the standards, the codes. Okay, that's good. But the question is, well, was it well constructed? Okay, uh, the the construction method, the materials that that were used. So there are factors there that are really hard to measure. And that's also something that is also possible in structural health monitoring because there you will be able to determine the actual performance of a, of a building. Um, and also we are looking at, in us, some of our uh, upcoming researches, we're going to look at what you call aging of structures uh, using the data that will that is derived from, from these instruments. Uh, another major important thing why we need this device is, as mentioned, uh, uh, during an earthquake. Okay, during an earthquake, uh, we would like to know if uh, structural limits are or were exceeded. Okay, uh, based on the design and uh, the acceleration readings, um, what well, were, were they exceeded? And after the earthquake. Um, is there any significant change in the performance of the building? That's very important. As mentioned, um, we have been telling people that it's safe to go back. Okay, and uh, we did uh, by just doing visual inspection. Okay, visual inspection. Imagine you have a, a high-rise building. Um, your engineer will go floor every floor and try to to check the main elements. Or components of your building, if there are visible or indications of structural damage, and most and most of these are usually hidden, okay, during its use, and also the foundation we need, okay. So uh, I'm not saying that the visual inspection should be removed, but visual inspection with a technology like structural health monitoring will help us really uh, come up with a, with a good decision whether the, the building is safe uh, uh, after an, an earthquake. Uh, this is very, uh, as you know, every time there's an earthquake, the government has maybe the DPWH or, or it's a city engineer's office to go and check their buildings. Now, the question is how about those private buildings, um, those... Uh, condominium units uh, who are really checking if the, they are still safe to be uh, to be used. And this is not something that is evident uh, in one event. Okay, I mean, uh, can, be, can be appreciated, I mean, can be appreciated in one event because we will be regularly hit, I mean, not regularly, but will be hit by earthquake Okay, because of our uh, geographic location, okay, we're, we're along the Pacific Long Fire. So the, the point there is that maybe in, in an event number one, two, and three, your structure withstand the, 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 the impact of the, of the earthquake. But how about the succeeding ones? Okay? As we know, anything that we built, we made, deteriorates in, with time. Okay? And that's the reason why you do uh, monitoring and not just for buildings but also for bridges because bridges are lifeline structures after an, uh, an earthquake so it's also important to make sure that uh, our network to our, our uh, lifelines when uh, after being hit by an earthquake will be uh, will be useful still uh, usable I mean uh, to provide the necessary uh, help uh, that we can give. Uh, one of our uh, audience uh, wants to clarify 
if this assistant is 100% cloud-based, and uh, he's asking if it could be integrated in the BMS, and uh, also wants to know if uh, there would be a data breach uh, on it. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, you have that option to do, to use our the, the cloud, uh, which is our standard uh, offering. Uh, the web portal is a standard offering for for our Azure units. Okay. You need not to ask us to develop. We already develop one. And another uh, unique feature of our web portal it, is that it does not just uh, it doesn't just um, uh, retrieve remote remotely retrieve uh, data or store data, but also we have tools like what you call this, the the structural health index module, wherein the um, the acceleration readings the raw data, okay, the raw data are in, are interpreted in relation to the thresholds. That's one the structural thresholds, if they were exceeded during the earthquake. Uh, second is that the performance of the building after the earthquake, okay? Because, uh, of course, at a normal condition, uh, we, we have a data set for that. Then after that, you, we compare that with the data set uh, after the earthquake. We, uh, of course, looking for significant difference. No? A significant difference would mean that maybe the structure have uh, suffered uh, structural uh, damage uh, um, uh, during the, the, the earthquake. So... And other parameters like even building resonance and other important uh, parameters or uh, that would help the structural engineer uh, really un uh, better understand the situation of the building uh, after the, the, the earthquake. So you, the standard is a cloud-based uh, system, but in some cases, there are we have clients who are, of course, very... Uh, sensitive when it comes to their data. So yes, you can also have your own uh, data set, uh, uh, center or uh, um, server no? if, if you would like to and remove it from the cloud. That's also possible. That's, that's a good thing about this, our system is that it is uh, flexible depending on the need of the, of the client. Now in the, in the breach, uh, of course, we, we do the the, the necessary uh, pre precautionary measures for security as any other uh, IT company, uh, a, a company that provides uh, IT products. Okay. But uh, of course, <laughs> uh, some people always find a way to, you know, do the breach and uh, I mean breach systems. But of course, that's uh, part of our job is to continuously uh, guard uh, our system uh, from that kind of app. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So one last uh, question. Uh, how do you manage the risk uh, of using the Azure, Azure system? Uh, what, um, what do you mean uh, the risk on? Uh, information technology risks. Okay, uh, like. That 100% uh, cloud-based uh, monitoring. Uh, yes. Maybe, maybe, sir, it's the data security risk and the cloud. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, the data security, we, we have our uh, IT unit to, to do that. And uh, as I understand, of course, uh, uh, the security measures that are necessary for any IT in, in system uh, is being applied. So, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I cannot uh, discuss the, the detail, but uh, of course, uh, it, it is being, uh, shall we say, it's being uh, uh, addressed uh, by, the, by, by our IT system, I, 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 IT, IT unit, and they have ways to do that, okay? And yes. Sir, uh, I have a personal question. As yes, sir. As the Dean of the School of Civil, Environmental, and Ge Geological Engineering of Papua University, I'm just curious, how does your university support a startup or innovative, a startup culture or a culture of innovation? So as, as PUP and other universities who are also our audience today can follow up on? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, based on our experience, okay. 
uh, I think I mentioned that uh, since uh, the time of the establishment of the of the university, it's our first time to 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 be engaged with a commer commercialization project with, with with Asher. So because uh, Ash um, Mapua has been really a teaching institution before, and uh, we recently uh, or maybe in the Maybe at least 10 years ago, we decided to go to, to research. Okay. Then uh, the Asher, when Asher started, uh, started with a project called Smart Bridge. And it's just, uh, it's, it is just a small project. Actually, it's, it's, it's just a small project compared to our other uh, uh, research projects at, at, at Mapua. Uh, but that's where, uh, um, you know, um, it's, it's a, no one, I mean, no one ever maybe during that time uh, thought that it's really something that can be commercialized. And, and we were not talk, even thinking about that before. Okay. So I think what the good thing is first is that uh, an institution will have to decide. That's the first thing I'm, I'm trying to point out is that you, you have to this to really decide an institution to really make an impact in research okay that's the first thing it's a it's a decision for the institution and say you want to be engaged in high impact research and whatever are the other details that comes with it it's a decision that will of course influence how are your faculty how the faculty uh, will take part on it okay so after you decide that, yes, we want to go to high impact research. Second is that you will have to provide the necessary uh, resources. But of course, resources, as I know, is, has been very <laughs> difficult to, or to, to just to easily uh, be provided in an, a lot of uh, universities. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of, of effort to really uh, acquire that. And the good thing about Mapua, I think, is that uh, one of the big things that they did that happened is that the the uni, the, the uh, management decided to to build what you call a research building center. Okay, because of course, where, where are we going to do our research work? Okay, our our buildings are pretty much occupied for for classes, so it's a big investment. So after you decide that. Yes, we want to go to high impact research. Then you have to uh, say to do what they say. Uh, um, you have to 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 provide the the, the necessary environment and uh, resources and support that you can give. But of course, it will it will not be enough. Okay, that happened. To us. The building is not enough because well, the building will require again uh, equipment. Okay. <laughs> people stuff okay so where did we get that okay that that's where DUST came in okay uh, first project our break uh, the, the break uh, the big break okay for for Mapua is this uh, Phil LIDAR project I think 2014 if I'm I call it correct 2014 the the Phil LIDAR project it is a uh, it's a very big project that was headed by our DUST Fisher director now Okay, Dr. Eric Paringit. So he was the project, uh, the program, program leader because we have a number of project leaders. The good thing about that project is, I really uh, appreciate that project is that uh, you have uh, UP uh, being the program uh, leader for that. Then you have project leaders from universities in different parts of the country. So it, it was a very good uh, initiative and all together we, we tried to accomplish the the for the, 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 the research uh, project so that's where in some equipments okay we're, we're acquired so external funding okay if you can if your internal funding is not enough then you will have to go for external funding okay and uh, the good thing about external fu funding nowadays is that even like DUST has been very active and providing this to us. It's just a matter for us to, of course, show that we are capable of doing the, the research project. Of course, there's a point 
or when you have to compete because you have to compete uh, in a nation uh, and uh, for for the, for any for the grant and as long as i think what i see is that as long as you have a good unique the uniqueness of your project is very important and the impact of the project is uh, very promising uh, i think you will not fail to get support from from the usd shirt and of course there are other agencies like i think ched uh, came up with the ched picari of course we were also one of those uh, brand the ched picari and also there are international there are a lot of international uh, organizations now who provide the uh, external grants okay now the rest will be up on how you manage okay after you have all those things you will have to to manage okay when you say manage uh, of course going now to the portion of commercialization um, well it depends on your it's important that you have an ip policy uh, pe people or researchers should know the rights and and the conditions uh, that before any research project okay because you will never know like i mentioned smart bridge is like just a small project we have field lidar we have other bigger project okay and you when you'll never know which one okay which one of those projects no matter how small it is will really uh, be successful in commercialization and even now we don't i'm not saying that actually is asher is totally successful already no not yet we're, we're trying to to get some kind of a, a milestone where we can say that yes, uh, uh, we are. But I'm what I'm saying is not yet. We're, but we're we're moving to that. So management is another important thing, and and the sustainability, uh, how you sustain the motivation, okay, the motivation and the drive, the drive of uh, of uh, your researcher is very important because when you lose that, okay. You know, negotiations are, uh, it's very sensitive uh, because there's something to do with economics, okay? Uh, but of course, as, as I know, a lot of us academicians sometimes just really want our results to be used and uh, be of help to, to other, uh, other people, okay? So um, I hope that uh, we continue to motivate and sustain uh, innovative environment in our respective institutions. Yun po. Thank you, sir. Ma medyo mahaba. Asensya na po. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Ma'am Jo? Okay. So, with that, uh, thank you very much, Sir Uy, for uh, that talk and clarifications on the questions of our participants uh, this morning. Uh, at this point, uh, if you have other questions, you may... Uh, Send it to our official email, the pchls at pup. So we could uh, send it to Dr. Uri and we could uh, get back uh, to your question if you have other clarification on his presentation. At this point, may I call on the Dean of the College of Engineering, Dr. Remedios G. Ado, for the awarding of the certificate. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So, Polytechnic University of the Philippines, this certificate of recognition is given to Dr. Francis Aldrin Uy in grateful acknowledgement of his distinguished and invaluable service rendered as guest of honor and speaker in the science, engineering, and technology professional Chairholder Lecture Series 2020 with the theme, An Enlightening Journey in Assuring a Safer and More Resilient Philippines. Given this 29th day of October 2020 at the PUP Main Campus, Santa Mesa, Manila, Philippines. Signed, Dr. Manuel M. Muhi, University President. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uwe. Thank you, sir. So uh, at this point, we'd like to remind the audience to uh, kindly uh, hit our uh, evaluation link, https colon slash slash bit 
dotly slash three d z f f two x for the evaluation form for you to get an electronic certificate for this event. So our next event next week that will be on November five and six. We have two lecture series as well. First, we have Dr. Florigo C. Varona on November five. At 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., and his topic will be the digital construction project management in a common data environment. And uh, on November 6, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Dr. Christian and Delia uh, will talk about enhancing engineering education through simulation-based learning. So this afternoon, we have another uh, distinguished guest, uh, the secretary from DOTR, uh, Dr. Sheila Napala. Dr. Orgi? Um, Dr. Napalang will discuss about active transport later in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3.30. So that ends our, the first part of our lecture series for the day, the talk of Dr. Uy. Um, next is, um, uh, next is, uh, we will play our PUP hymn, but please stay put so as we could uh, have a photo up after the PUP hymn. Thank you. Requesting everyone to open your video feed so as we could take our picture. Sir Joseph. Wait lang po. Marami pong screens, 12. <laughs> Smile lang po. Nasa chat box po yung, ano, yung link for our evaluation. Okay na po. Hindi pa po.
smile for Okay na po. We would like to thank Dr. Uy for sharing his expertise today. And we will also like to acknowledge our participants from Saudi Arabia, University of the East, Isabella State University, Visaya State University, University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Antipolo City Local Government, PUP Graduate School, PICE QC, the Local Government of Batangas, CAAP, LGU of Baguio, the Department of Transportation, Bicol University, National University, Department of Public Works and Highway, Pais Inlac, Mapua, Batangas State University, if FEU Institute of Tech, MPDO, and TIP Manila. We've, um, that ends our the first part of our um, lecture series. Later in this the afternoon at 1.30, Dr. Napalang will share his ex her expertise in the field of active transport. See you by 1.30. I am Orland Delfino Tobola. I'm Engineer Josie Golpeo. And we are your master ceremony for today. Thank you and see you later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Salamat po. Ingat. Salamat sa lahat. Yung link daw, sir, hindi ma-access. May pinost po kung updated na link po. Please try po. Okay, ano, paka ano sa screen, pa, pa na yung participants na hindi maka-access. Okay, na Ayun naman eh. Na-access naman po yung link. Mabagal lang po talaga.